tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Heidi Colonna. Heidi is Curriculum Development Manager for the Humane Society of the United States and board member with the Association of Professional Humane Educators. She got her start in the humane field as an MSPCA shelter volunteer in 1994 and became an employee in 1999. She's worked on education programs with the HSUS since 2002, serving as Director of Student Outreach from 2006 to 2011. Previously, she was a research assistant at the Tufts Center for Animals and Public Policy and a veterinary technician. Heidi earned an MS in Animals and Public Policy from Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine and a BS in Animal Science from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, a mass teaching license for grades five through eight and Certified Humane Education Specialist credentials. She lives in Westfield with her husband, two sons, and rescued cat and dog. Heidi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stacy, for having me. So Heidi, how did you get started in animal welfare? Well, as you said, I started out as a shelter volunteer. And in 94, it was really a different time for animals. The shelter I volunteered at was actually in the basement of an old building. And this is where I would visit a lot as a kid with my brother. There were these paw prints on the ground. We would follow down to the basement. And it was always really exciting to see the animals. I had found my childhood dog there, and she's very closely connected to this work for me, Gretchen, my old dog. This is also where I learned about euthanasia from my brother. We were crouched down looking into a kennel, and he explained to me that this dog's time was limited. And it was really earth-shattering news for someone who's really sensitive and who loves animals. And I think from that day, I wanted to help. My uncle was also a veterinarian, and anytime he would talk about saving an animal, I had no doubt I wanted to do that. So I volunteered, like you said, as a young college student, and my heart was pulling me to help animals. My mind was pulling me in other directions at times. I had been accepted into some business studies, but I decided to take the leap and work full-time for animals, and I'm really glad I did. My first full-time in the field ended up being at that same shelter doing events and special projects. But it was working as a vet tech just a couple years later on the road to vet school that I decided to switch gears and specialize in education. I was at our large emergency hospital and I saw the full spectrum of things happening. There was a lot of things playing with my emotions. You know, there's death and suffering, of course, that was really hard. There's one story in particular that sticks with me. There were two girls who brought in a gecko who was flat out on his back and he was in a coma from not getting the care he needed. It was the middle of February, freezing winter in New England. And I just felt so bad for this poor little creature from the tropics up here in the freezing weather. It was that case and cases like it that bothered me more and drew me more than the medical side of working with animals. It was when people had a lack of understanding or empathy. The things that bothered me weren't medical problems as much as the people problems, the preventable ones. And I really wanted to work on the root of the problems and thought humane education can prevent situations like that gecko where people lack knowledge of basic care or in other cases, lack of empathy. So in any cases, it was those early positions that I started to get a real hunger for the people piece of animal welfare. And that's what led me to the Tufts program, which, by the way, is where I got my own cats finally after being very dog centric. (laughs) (laughs) So in your mind, though, in those early days, what was humane education That's a really good question. It was really broad back then. I just wanted to spread awareness. I wanted to teach my point of view to people and spread awareness, not only on the facts on how to care for animals, but to change attitudes. The whole study of attitudes was really interesting to me. And we learned that at Tufts quite a bit, the theory behind attitudes and the studies that had been done. So yeah, it was broad. And at Tufts, I did learn that humane education is actually a thing, is a field. And there were workshops going on, and I learned that HSUS had the youth division, so I got a little more concrete with it. So when you first started, did you have any specific mentors that helped guide you through this process? 
Absolutely. Lots of different mentors with direct animal care back at the shelter. Pam Peebles, she's now at ED for TJ O'Connor Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. But she was the one who taught me how to clean a cat cage. And she was my first teacher in getting me comfortable working with cats. I didn't have as much experience with cats, everything from cleaning to socializing. And eventually when I started working there, I was, you know, working on adoptions and drawing blood and vaccinating and have to credit my two cats, Sophia and Magic, who are really my ambassadors to the feline world. I remember being drawn to every dilute tortoise shell cat in the shelter. Sophia, the little gray one, she's in my picture for this podcast. She was just so gentle and she was the first cat I had and she was a kitten. And I just couldn't believe how vulnerable she was because that's the side when you don't know cats, you hear the stereotypes that they're independent, but you don't see their vulnerable side until you sometimes have a personal relationship. And then at Tufts, I was able to have really great mentors. Carter Luke, who's president of MSPCA now, was a former school teacher. So he was a perfect mentor for me. And another undergrad literature professor of mine also was at Tufts later, Marion Copeland. And she helped kind of crack open my mind to other bigger issues like environmentalism, animal protection, animals as teachers in literature, which is a really interesting field. There's all kinds of great literature out there with animals as main characters who are great for using in humane education to get people to change their perspectives and see animals in a different light through literature, through creative, through fiction. Then, of course, coming to HSUS and really recently, I've worked alongside really great cat protection experts, Katie Lisnick and Danielle Bays, and they've both been through the Tufts program, so I knew them as alumni. And then Neighborhood Cats is a group we've recently partnered with to create a TNR training, an online course. And I cannot believe the breadth of knowledge they have. They authored this course. They had I think it was 140 pages of material on how to do TNR from making sure you have a can opener in case you don't find the pull tabs and you have to run out. I mean, every little detail is in this material. And I learned how to do TNR myself in helping to build this training. It's an impressive list of people. I just want to take a step back and you had mentioned using animals and literature to be able to educate. And in our pre-interview show, you had mentioned a children's book. Yeah, sure. This is a book called Nobody's Cats, How One Little Black Kitty Came In from the Cold. And it was published last year by one of our members at APHE, the Association of Professional Humane Educators. Her name's Valerie Ingram. She's up in British Columbia, and she actually does youth presentations in schools. She's a community cat caretaker. She works at the Lakes Animal Friendship Society in BC. This book is based on a true story of a boy who heard what she was doing and said, oh, I have a little black cat and all these cats who, you know, my neighbors say they're nobody's cats and they live in this barn. And she said, well, no, they're not nobody's cats. They're our community cats cats. She said, ask your parents and meet up with me there. And she showed them what a trap was. And they went through this together. She actually worked with a school. She had like 700 kids vote on what the ending to the story should be. And they said, we want him to adopt the cat. Of course, the other cats go back to the barn and they're cared for by the caretakers. It's a really great story. Voting on the ending, just like all the movies out there, everybody wants (laughs) to vote on a certain ending of the movie. Heidi, can you tell me a bit more about what you're doing now and how it impacts community cats? Yeah, absolutely. My time at HSUS is now divided between humane education and the adult training. So we're all under this education umbrella called Humane Society Academy at HSUS. The first thing I'd like to talk about is those online trainings I mentioned for professionals in animal care and advocacy and also for those volunteering. They really cover a wide range of issues. I talked about the TNR course. What my role is to turn the expert information into engaging learning experiences. We have a course platform called Digital Talk. You can see the instructors talking to you through webcam. So we've really come a long way with the online trainings. In our old system, when I first started, it was all reading through slides online, which was really boring for a lot of people. But now you can see your instructor talking to you. You can do interactive questions back and forth. You can learn from other students learning at the same time through discussion forums, and we get a lot of good feedback on that. One of our most popular programs is actually called the Certified Humane Education Specialist Program. You mentioned I earned that credential myself, and we uh, still teach that, and it's really popular. So this is to learn how to actually learn the theory behind humane education and how to go into schools and develop a lesson plan. This is a series of courses. You take five courses to get that credential from the HSUS. I've also been involved in a lot of webinars, free webinars. I just presented one on catios with Cynthia Chomos of Catio Spaces and Karen Krauss from Feral Cat Coalition of Oregon, Jennifer Hillman and Daniel Bays with the HSUS. It was a really fun webinar about these cat patios, which are kind of all the rage, especially in the Northwest. They do these home and garden style catio tours. And then we're doing one August 31st on managing public and free roaming feline health concerns. Concerns with Dr. Sandra Norman, a public health vet. 
So yeah, I really love being involved with courses and webinars because like we were saying in the pre-show, not everybody could get to conferences in person. So these are ways for sharing to happen and learning to happen and you could be right in your home. Yeah, I love online education myself. I think that if you can't be at a conference and you don't have the time or the money, you know, you have a couple of kids. I have a couple of kids. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, get away from the kids. (laughs) Yes, it is. So online education is great. I'm a big fan of on-demand online education, too. You do lose a bit of that community feeling, that interaction, but yet you can do it at any time and whatever works for your schedule. But I do think that it's so important to have education in your life constantly if you are assisting community cats. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Ready to make a big difference for cats in your community? We've got an exciting opportunity that can jumpstart your efforts. The Community Cats Podcast has launched Community Cats Grants. When you qualify for this innovative program, you'll gain valuable knowledge about how to raise funds for your spay-neuter efforts. Plus, we'll match the funds you raise up to $1,000, doubling your ability to make a difference for cats. Fundraising doesn't have to be scary. We'll be with you every step of the way. Check it out. You can find all of the details on the Community Cats Podcast website, under our education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. What is the typical student like who signs up for these? Are they employees at shelters or volunteers, or is it a mixture of people? Yeah, we get a lot of people who are learning, who are working with groups like Neighborhood Cats in New York City, who are working for a nonprofit, all-volunteer TNR group, you know, instead of staff who are leading the charge or other volunteers having to do the training, volunteers will just get sent to our online course. We have shelter professionals. It's the whole gamut of people looking to help community cats. One thing that I find is a little bit challenging with regards to education and community cats is there's a fine line in a way, too, between advocacy and education. And I also find that we're so focused on like spay, neuter, spay, neuter, spay, neuter, is that we just want to get that objective out there. But yet we're not taking the time to do a full education or even an advocacy working with public officials. It's hard to cover the whole scope of what managing community cats is about. And I just was wondering what you thought looking forward was happening with regards to humane education on the topic of community cats. Are we growing in that area? Will we catch up to the big spay neuter push? What do you see happening? Yeah, I feel like TNR came first and now education is starting to work in community cats and TNR. You know, the book, Nobody's Cats is a perfect example. And the fact that at APHE, we're working on incorporating more community cat issues. I'm working on incorporating a lesson, a service learning project into one of our camp manuals to have students build feral cat shelters and feeding stations. I think there's a little lag there to have it all come together. And I'm just so excited to be on this show and to be working with more community cat caregivers. Yeah, I think that a lot of groups are a little lost in the challenges of developing an education program. Would you have any tips for a group that's starting out that would like to bring education into, say, the local school system? Are there directed resources or tips that you might be able to provide that group? Yes. And that's the other side of my work, like I said, is the humane education and making sure that there's good resources to support educators and everybody out in the field and to bring new people into the fold. And being back to school time now in September, fall is really a great time. I think it's, I hate to say there are any quiet times in animal care, but it's one of the quieter times, it seems. And it's a good time to start up relationships with schools. Obviously, schools are a great forum for reaching large groups of kids in a really targeted, systematic way. Community cat caretakers are in neighborhoods and so are schools. So they're really closely connected and it's a great way to target. So what we usually recommend is it's kind of a three-step approach, learning schools goals. And you can do that by going on district websites, talking to teachers you know. Most people will know of some teacher or someone who knows a teacher and you can ask to come in and give a presentation and that will often get you started and grease the wheels for maybe a bigger relationship with the school. Two, we always say choose engaging activities. So community cat caretakers, whether you're working in a shelter or you're out taking care of a colony, you will be incredibly interesting to young people to begin with, just as someone who works with animals. You can be, you know, the cat ambassadors for kids in your community, but you do have to prepare engaging activities as opposed to just standing up and lecturing. Show them how a trap works. Show them a shelter or feeding station. You know, ask them 
why they think those particular stations work well, those structures work well. A lot of kids love to be hands-on, to learn by doing. Kids love to hear stories. I mentioned the one book. And then there's another great book you talked about, Spay Neuter, called It's Raining Cats and Cats, which is a great one on Spay Neuter by the Griffin Press. And these are ways you can get the conversation going. And if you're new to working with kids and you're just a little scared about going and being in front of a classroom, a story is a great way to take the focus off yourself and tell a good story and get the questions started and get the conversation going and share pictures. You know, Valerie Ingram in British Columbia will go to classrooms twice a year and update students on the colonies and show pictures and talk about different cats she sees all the time. Show videos. It's a great way to bring what you're doing out in the field into a classroom. And another thing that's really catching on lately is using Skype in the classroom. We had one teacher, our Humane Teacher of the Year in Florida, She saw how her kids went crazy for dolphins on vacation and she decided to partner up with a boat captain and Skype the dolphin research going on out in the water into her classroom in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And she actually saw reading scores shoot up like you wouldn't believe because they incorporated the Dolphin Tail book, Dolphin Tail Junior, different dolphin related literature. And so you see animals are such an engaging topic for students. So if you can bring it into what they're doing, the schools are going to see a benefit. And of course, you're going to see a benefit because they're learning about animals. And then the last piece of advice I would say is to follow humane educators who are already out there. We've talked about the great sharing that goes on in this work in general. The APHE is a really great resource because we have a listserv, so you can ask questions. We have new people all the time asking questions about what should I do with this age group or what topic should I teach to this one. And we not only have a conference and the listserv, but we have resources online as well, like lesson plans. HumaneSociety.org also has lesson plans on our parents and educators page. So... These are great ways to get connected and to get into another sharing sub-community in the animal welfare field. The last thing I want to say is we have the classroom newspaper, Kind News, which is also really, really good way to keep your message in classrooms after you visit. And I'm one of the reviewers on that publication. It's been published since 1985, and we are always covering a lot of cat issues, a lot of other issues as well. But cats are definitely a big one and spay neuter as well. Is there a certain age range that you would target or all ages are important? You know, these things I've been talking about, you can do with kids as young as age six. The um, Nobody's Cats book is really meant for kids who are six years old, which would be grade one. It's tricky with spay neuter because schools don't get into reproduction until Mm, more like grade three. And that's even like basic plant and invertebrate reproduction in grade five or six. And it varies from state to state. But about grade five or six, about age 10, 11 is more when they really know about reproduction and can grasp spay neuter fully, but we definitely talk about it in a really basic way. Like this is how to prevent animals from having babies, you know, in the younger grades. And then when you get into more like the later elementary, middle and high school grades is when service learning is bigger. What service learning is, is it's community service that combines an academic component. They'll go out into the community and do service and come back and talk about it and kind of connect their academics to what they did. This is growing in communities all throughout the country. It's been going on for a long time. And you can see if your district has a program and see if students can get involved and help with community cat caretaking as part of service learning. And I just want to mention here that Heidi has agreed to do a live presentation to the Boston Homeless Cats Group at 6 p.m. on September 12th. And I just wanted to mention that because we are going to be showing her on Facebook Live on the Community Cats Podcast Facebook page. So if you tune in, you'll be able to ask questions and listen to Heidi's presentation with regards to humane education for community cats at that meeting. So please feel free to tune in. Heidi, is there any way that people can find you if they want to reach out with more questions? Absolutely. In fact, I was just going to say, if you can't make it to that presentation, I'm happy to work with everybody to customize something and help you work with your schools. So you can email me at hcolona, H-C-O-L-O-N-N-A at humanesociety.org. If you want to check out our courses, webinars, and we also have scholarships for some of the courses because there is a fee for our courses. The website for that is humanesociety.org slash academy. I talked about the lesson plans page. The APHE is APHE.org. Yeah, reach out to me. I'm happy to work with individuals and recommend specific things. And is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? 
you know, a couple things I see those in TNR and sheltering getting so overwhelmed. It's really common. We do have a new course on compassion fatigue, compassion stress. It's called Building Your Balance. So I just want to throw that out. I think that's really helpful for those of us who work in this day to day. In addition to the formal humane ed work, I mean, everybody doing community caretaking is a role model. So I just encourage everybody to talk with kids in your neighborhood as you're feeding, if they're seeing you, you know, to start conversations, ask them if they like cats and tell them what you're doing. And you really are good role models for kids. And I would hope that kids take note of what you're doing and that you can start some relationships. Heidi, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you'll be willing to be a guest on our show in the future. Thank you so much, Stacey. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Community Cats Podcast. If you could go to iTunes and review the show, we'd really appreciate it. When you do, take a screenshot of your review, go to communitycatspodcast.com forward slash review and enter your information and we'll send you a t-shirt. While you're there, don't forget to check out all the ways you can support the content you're passionate about. Thanks, everyone.